Okay. Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. We broadcast the show live um, at every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. Uh, but if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show as we are doing this morning and we do then post it to our Library Commission um, Library Commission's YouTube channel for our archives. And I'll show you at the end of today's show where you can access all of our show archives on our website. Both the live show and the recordings are free and open to anyone to watch. So um, please do share with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, uh, anyone you think might be interested in any of the topics we have on the show. Uh, for those of you not from Nebraska, the Nebraska Library Commission is a state agency for libraries, um, similar to your whatever state library, and so we provide services to all types of libraries in the state. So you will find shows on Encompass Live for all types of libraries, uh, public, academic, K-12, uh, commissioner, archives, corrections, museums, uh, et cetera, so it goes on and on. <laughs> really, our only criteria is that it is something to do with libraries, something that libraries are doing, something we think they could be doing. Uh, we do book reviews, interviews, mini training sessions, demos of services and products. Um, it just runs the gamut. Uh, we have Nebraska Library Commission staff that sometimes come on the show and do presentations about services and programs we're offering to the state. Um, we also bring in guest speakers as we have this morning. Uh, this morning uh, joining me is Amy Schindler. Good morning, Amy. Good morning, Krista. And yeah, she is the Director of Archives and Special Collections um, at the University of Nebraska Omaha uh, Chris Library, up north of us here on McGowan and Lincoln. She's in Omaha, so we're doing this remotely together. And uh, she's going to talk to us today about the Queer Omaha Archives. And it says here the first five years, because five years ago in 2016, actually, Amy was on the show right when this was first opening up. <laughs> um, so we were very excited back then to, to announce that there's this great new um, archive, this new resource that we've been put together. And now um, Amy reached out and wants to talk about what's been happening in those first five years. So um, go ahead and take it away, Amy. So I would like to begin by acknowledging that the University of Nebraska at Omaha is a metropolitan university with campuses, programs, service learning, and community engagement spread across the past, present, and future homelands of the Pawnee, Ponca, Oto, Missouri, Omaha, Dakota, Lakota, Arapaho, Cheyenne, and Kaw peoples, as well as the relocated Ho-Chunk, Iowa, and Sac and Fox people. Please take a moment to consider the legacies of more than a century of displacement, violence, settlement, and survival that brings us together here today. Um, at the University of Nebraska at Omaha, we respect and seek out inclusion of differences, realizing that we can learn from each other. And we look forward to building, hopefully continuing to build long-lasting relationships with the indigenous people of Nebraska. To learn more about the indigenous native territories and languages where you may be living or located today, um, I encourage you to visit the Native Land website, that's native-land.ca. And for my fellow Nebraskans out there, I want to remind us that October 11th will be the first, the very first, statewide Indigenous Peoples Day. And yes. you can visit the um, Indian Affairs State Agency for some more information about that. Um, I also uh, want to thank the UNL, University of Nebraska-Lincoln, Native American Coalition for sharing their land acknowledgement on their website, um, which I have um, used and slightly amended here today. So um, next, uh, Krista, thank you, you know, for having me back on Encompass Live um, to talk about UNO's Queer Omaha Archives uh, five years later. Um, I'm glad we could do this in October, which for those of you who may not know, um, October is, is a, just a whammy month for me. Um, it's LGBTQ History Month, yay. Um, it's also American Archives Month, so there's a double yay. Um, you know, and lots of other months. There's Family History Month in October. The first half of October is Hispanic Heritage Month. Um, but I'm here to say, um, just because of those first two months. <laughs> so um, as Krista said, my name is Amy Schindler. Um, I use she, her pronouns, um, hopefully, as you saw. Um, I want to just sort of give you context about who I am. Um, so I'm a cisgender, straight, uh, white woman. Um, I'm an archivist. Um, I'm a first-generation college student. And I acknowledge that I'm I'm a colonizer here. 
in Omaha. Um, I moved to the Great Plains um, only in 2014. So today I'm going to talk about um, the beginnings of the archives five years ago. And then I want to tell you about some of the material in the collection. Um, that could be a whole, you know, couple of hours. So <laughs> thank you for indulging me and, and sharing some of that. So what the great but it's okay if it takes longer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That that'll just be like, you know, you can have me back again in the future, Krista. I could talk. I could talk. Um, but um, so I'll talk about some of those things, um, you know, and just kind of overall tell you about this growing initiative. Um, I'll talk about some of the programming and outreach um, we've been doing, a little bit about what we want to do. And then, you know, throughout there'll be some lessons learned <laughs> um, and some ongoing um, um, things that we're doing, maybe some things we hope to do in the future. So um, the QOAs, so the Queer Omaha Archives, um, its beginnings, as Krista mentioned, you know, were over five years ago, actually. In the fall of 2015, my UNO colleague, Dr. Jesse Hitchens, um, who is the director of our Gender um, and Sexuality Resource Center, she um, uh, led uh, bringing to campus um, a speaker from another university who uh, came in October, LGBTQ History Month, and was talking about, um, you know, LGBTQ history, but also, you know, he, he had some work in archives, and so he was talking about archives, and that was really um, um, a great seed that was planted, um, and we brought together some people from across campus, some faculty and some students, some staff, um, and they were hearing what he was talking about, and, and so then the conversation was like, hey, do you want to do that here? And I was like, let's do that here. Yes. <laughs> so um, we actually, uh, Jesse, um, with my, you know, full-throated support, then organized sort of a formal meeting um, at the end of that year to bring together not only some of those campus folks who had expressed an interest during LGBTQ History Month, but then also inviting in representatives from some community organizations and then um, specific representatives um, from student organizations as well to talk um, about, hey, let, can we start this LGBTQ collection here at the University of Nebraska at Omaha Libraries? Um, folks were very enthusiastic. Um, during that meeting, though, you know, we talked about a whole range of issues. I did a little bit of Archives 101 education, like explaining what, what is an archives? <laughs> what would be here? What would we do with this material? Um, what, what could happen? Um, folks brainstormed potential, you know, individuals and organizations that we should talk to about potentially um, donating, you know, personal papers, organizational records. Uh, people were very enthusiastic about uh, collecting oral history interviews. So we talked about uh, potential for that. Um, great conversation. Uh, we also talked about the scope of the project and you know it's QO for Omaha archives um, and that was a very intentional on my part I said you know I hadn't I'll be honest I hadn't done enough of my homework at that point I hadn't reached out and talked to you know some of the other cultural heritage organizations in the state yet so I actually wasn't aware of what was happening outside of Omaha or might be happening outside of Omaha as far as collecting um, but I had because I was new to Omaha I'd already talked to a lot of my um, colleagues at other heritage institutions here in uh, around the city and so I felt confident saying no one else in the city of Omaha and its environs is it has a, a concentrated LGBTQ plus collecting initiative so this is something we could you know I can safely say we can do for Omaha and you know for those who don't know Council Bluffs Iowa is right across the Missouri River from Omaha so we're part of the same metro area so I do kind of include Council Bluffs in there a bit um, officially as well as unofficially sometimes um, so we talked about that and I said let's focus on Omaha to start OK, um, and then I, I said, you know, I think very quickly and organically, um, we will, in fact, become the de facto, um, we could become a de facto um, collection for um, LGBTQ plus uh, material from across Nebraska and Western Iowa. And that did come to pass. But the name um, Queer Omaha Archives was selected at that meeting. Um, and I talk about that in a bit of detail here because, um, you know, that was one lesson learned. Um, you know, that was an early misstep on my part. Um, you know, the word queer, uh, we use it in academia. You know, we're talking about the discipline um, when uh, students and um, faculty and staff are talking about identities. Queer is a word that, you know, is it's, it's, it's just, it's everywhere here. Um, maybe not everywhere, but it's very easily used. Um, but, you know, what I should have said um, more strongly in that meeting was, hey, 
this word, um, there may there will be folks in the community, um, especially the baby boomer generation, who will have an, um, a negative reaction to that word. And that certainly did come to pass. Um, now, as far as I know, um, the name of the collection, collecting initiative has not resulted in any folks specifically saying, hey, um, we're not going to donate material or engage with you. But it has certainly meant that um, we've, in some cases, sort of had to pause maybe moving forward and, and had to do some um, ongoing conversations um, about language, evolving uses, um, intentionality, um, and that. So mm -hmm. um, now the purpose of the QOA, um, like most um, archival um, initiatives, is to collect, preserve, and share LGBTQ um, IA2 Spirit Plus history. Um, and again, we are looking at Omaha, but also the entire state of Nebraska and Western Iowa and intentionally through archival material. So just so we're clear what we mean by archival material, um, you know, photos, scrapbooks, um, flyers, posters, audio recordings, video recordings, correspondence, meeting minutes, newsletters, um, and for us also local newsletters um, and newspapers too. Uh, there we go. Um, so when we started, um, we very intentionally said, um, no, thank you. We are not accepting books at this time. Um, and we were only accepting periodicals, so newspapers or magazines, if they were from Omaha um, or maybe Lincoln a little bit too. Um, so no surprise to any of us library workers, um, people really wanted to give us their books and their magazines, um, their personal libraries um, that they'd been holding on to. Like that was from like day one of um, this, this going public. So, um, for example, um, in July of 2016, we held an opening reception. We were welcomed in campus and the Omaha community members to come in and see um, some of what we'd already collected, to hear about what we were planning to do, um, you know, and just kind of you know, meet and greet and that sort of thing. Um, and so, you know, there were lots of people who were very happy to chat about possibly donating their archival material that they'd been holding on to, um, you know, for any number of years. But there were also immediately people who were like, hey, how about my books? I've got, you know, dozens, hundreds, thousands of books I'd like to give you. Can I, I and then even some people brought in boxes of um, local magazines and newspapers, you know, at that event, um, which is lovely to see. But then it's also like, hang on, we need to have a conversation here and I need to explain to you. Um, thank you so much for thinking of us. Um, we are not accepting books specifically at this time and, and said, you know, in the future, we can talk about those books that might be in your storage unit or your, you know, your garage and that sort of thing. But right now, it's it's just very important when we were getting started to be able to focus on not what am I going to do with 3,000 books that I've got to find some place to store and eventually sort through, but let's focus on the archival material, those primary sources. Um, so we assured folks that we would consider books in the future. And I said, we will get back to you about that. Um, and, and we did. <laughs> so um, just, you know, uh, no surprise there to anybody. So um, this slide is just about where we at in the archives today, like sort of number wise. So we've had over 40 individuals and organizations donate either archival material um, and or books and periodicals to us. Um, as far as archival material goes, that comes out to over 80 cubic feet and over three gigabytes of material. Um, the book collection um, has grown um, to over 3,000 titles. Um, as far as books go, we are accepting um, anything. It's mostly US printed material, but anything in English really, um, fiction, nonfiction, um, does not have to have a connection to Omaha, Nebraska, or Western Iowa. Um, with the newspapers and magazines, um, it's, you know, almost exclusively though, those do have to have that um, local connection. So, um, and that's that's fairly hyper-local, like in Nebraska um, or um, like Council Bluffs, Western Iowa. Um, we won't accept anything from like even, you know, Kansas City, which is three hours away. It's like, nope, they have a wonderful um, LGBT archives down there. Let's connect you to them. <laughs> um, so the, how do we get books so fast? Um, well, one way was, um, the GLBT, um, I'm sorry, the Rainbow, Out Rainbow Outreach GLBT Center of Omaha, which closed several years ago before the archive was started here, um, they were the first large donor of um, to give us their library of, um, I think it ended up being over about 2,000 titles we added from their collection. And then um, a man named Dr. Jim Metter uh, was retiring. Um, 
uh, and was planning to, um, you know, he was downsizing, moving out of Omaha. And so he had about, he was a voracious reader. So he had about a thousand books of late 20th, early 21st century um, LGBTQ fiction that he donated to us. That was a wonderful, um, those were two wonderful collections to really kick off the book collection. And then we've continued to receive, you know, a fairly steady stream of, of those book donations from folks, um, you know, a couple dozen books here and there, maybe, you know, a hundred or so at a time. Um, and then also um, in the past when I, we had library funds available for book purchasing, um, I would consciously um, buy some uh, titles, um, LGBTQ specific titles, either, you know, mm -hmm. more historical things, um, but then also recently published material. So um, that included books, um, by and or about Omaha people, um, but then also zines published by um, local Omaha folks here, um, whether they themselves were LGBTQ or the topic related to gender and sexuality. So um, one of my longer term development and fundraising goals for um, the QOA is that we would have a fund, um, um, an endowment specifically established um, mm -hmm. for you know ongoing acquisitions. That would allow us to not only keep purchasing new material and older, um, you know, historical material, but then also, you know, when we have a donor who's out of town and has to ship something to us, so we can reimburse that person because sometimes that can be a real barrier for some some people who want to um, want to give to us. Not mm -hmm. a top priority, but it's on my list <laughs> of things we want to support. So um, I'm going to roll here into highlighting some of the things from the collection that we have. So this first um, couple slides here are about some of these um, local, you know, I'll call it newspapers, magazines. In some cases, they're like newsletter format or tabloid format. So um, there on the left, Gay Freedom. This is the oldest LGBTQ newsletter that we know about that was published here in Omaha. And that was in um, August 1972. Um, we only have the one issue, unfortunately. It's just front and back of a single page. Um, this is digitized on our website. Um, you know, we don't know a lot about this organization. Um, it, the membership was anonymous, which is not terribly surprising, um, but we are fortunate. We do know a bit about them um, in part because, you know, this is post Stonewall, right? So the LGBTQ rights movement is happening, including here in Omaha and across the Midwest. Um, but uh, some of the members were actually um, interviewed by the Omaha World Herald, which is our local major daily newspaper here in Omaha. So we have a bit more information about this group. Mm -hmm. um, down the road in Lincoln, there um, were student groups active at the university there, as well as community and alumni groups that were fairly closely interwoven. So we had things like the Lincoln Gay News, um, UnGag, um, and other publications from Lincoln that were being published throughout the 1970s. Um, but here in Omaha, we didn't get another, you know, kind of Omaha-specific publication until the late 1970s when Gain, Gay Awareness Iowa, Nebraska came out. And that was um, a multi-page newsletter published for about three years. At least we have three years of issues. And, you know, that publication was talking about a whole host of things and topics that um, sadly are not unfamiliar to us today. So they would be talking about, you know, hey, you know, we're getting harassed in public, you know, whether it's um, someplace like the the kind of the neighborhood, the, the block where folks would be cruising, or whether it was coming out of bars or being in bars, you know, being harassed in public, let alone private homes. So they were, you know, um, or the police, if someone was, you know, attacked and beat up, um, the police weren't doing anything um, to try and, you know, find the folks who were assaulting uh, members of the community. And then also very publicly, um, uh, talking about and then talking to politicians who, um, you know, were um, putting out like homophobic ads um, as part of their campaign politics. Um, so really um, doing a lot of great work there. Um, and then we have the New Voice of Nebraska, and this was published from 1984 to 1998. Um, it's first uh, about two years, yeah, about two years. It was published in Lincoln. And then, you know, the initial publisher, you know, just kind of so it's a lot of work putting out this regular uh, monthly publication. And so he was going to close it down. But some folks here in Omaha were like, hold on, this can't go away. This is too valuable. It's a wonderful, wonderful magazine that's coming out. So they moved the publication to Omaha and volunteers took it over and kept it going um, then for more than a decade. Um, so all of all of those years of the new voice are available on our website. Um, and we're very fortunate um, that we've got multiple paper sets of this 
um, that were donated by um, supporters of the archives. And then a community member before um, years ago, they with their scanner at home, they had digitized the whole um, run of the new voice at home on their scanner. And uh, we got a copy of that. So um, that was the late Dino Andrade, and um, that's that's lovely. It saved us a lot of labor. Um, unfortunately, though, you know, it was done at home with their home scanner, so the quality isn't what you know we, the archivists, would have done, would have had um, our folks doing. But it it's you know the OCR isn't perfect. It's far from perfect, but um, it is available. So and that's a, a, been a wonderful resource for us these last five years, or so that it's been online. You mentioned OCR because someone did ask, and I was going to bring it up later. Um, you said these are scanned on your website. They are searchable then as well. Mm -hmm. the yep. Yeah. All of our um, digital collections are. We use Islandora now, um, but um, I don't have an OCR like rate on this but it's certainly lower than you would um you would you would have big but that you'd be creating in your library or archives i'll just say that um but yeah you can you can do that it's all ocr yep um let's see here sorry um and then you know in the 90s and early 2000s there were another uh, a number of other newspaper tabloid format um publications coming out of omaha and lincoln and, and again western iowa um we have the river city beat times of the heartland there was another one um, called the buzz that was primarily more of a lesbian lens um these are some publications we only have like one two very scattered issues of so we're really hoping to get more of these um as well as any other publications that may be out there. So um, the New Voice of Nebraska closed or shut down, published the last issue in 1998. There was a little bit of a vacuum there, um, but 1999, what be, eventually became the Gaze that was first published. And you can see on the left there that what's happening, um, it was first published basically as a calendar of events. Because um, you know that had been part of the new voices. You know, in the back of the new voice, there is always the calendar. What's coming up? Um, so it started as like, what's what's going on? You know, what events are there at bars, churches, um, you know, theater productions, other just you know, what's the chorus doing? All those kinds of things. Um, and then it grew out from there to be more of um, you know that that magazine size, but um, you know, multiple page coming out regularly, um, biweekly for the most part. Um, although publication did vary, so it's fine final issue, um, towards the end there, it was only being published online, um, and its final issue was published in December 2016. So we had started the archives at that point, and we've, I'd been very fortunate um, to, to meet the folks, um, Jay Tremont and George Broadway, who were publishing it. Um, at the end, and they very generously not only gave us, you know, a complete paper run of it, but then also gave us um, their digital files and gave us consent to put that online. So that's online um, along with the New Voice of Nebraska. So we've got this great representation of, um, you know, at least some voices of Nebraska's LGBTQ plus history from 1984 to 2016, freely available open access. Um, so the first one I want to talk about here is uh, Terry Sweeney. Um, he donated uh, the Terry Sweeney Pat Phelan papers. Um, he was our first donor that came to us from outside of the university. So he wasn't um, alumnus or employee. Um, and luckily for us, Terry is a saver. Okay, so he has saved photos, he saved cards, um, flyers, posters, um, some home movies, um, other thing, other memorabilia, um, and he's donated that to um, the archives and it documents you know their involvement in their employee resource group um, eagle in the 1980s in uh, their involvement with you know pride parades and pride celebrations in omaha but then also going to national events um, so here we go so you know terry and pat and other friends they would go to events like the gay games um, which were held, you know, kind of like the Olympic style competition, right? So they went to a couple of those. They went to the marches on Washington, 1987 and 1993, which were known as the, basically the second and third uh, March on Washington for lesbian, gay and bi rights. Um, 
uh, so he shared this and you know Terry also was very generous and um, gave us his time so he came in after the donation um, for a long time and was identifying you know who's in these photos so we have in our database as much as Terry remembers who's in these photos when they were taken what events they were all that good stuff um, so you know what's on this screen here are you know some of those national events I was talking about um, on the bottom there um, this kind of plays out um, something that's very specific to the 1980s and early 1990s, but people, I, some students still know about this, younger folks still know about this, but um, that shows Terry and Pat and friends um, creating the Project um, Memory AIDS quilts where for their friend or panel mm -hmm. for their friend, Jonathan Schneider. Um, so they're on the left, you know, they got a glue gun and they are, what they're gluing down there is, um, Jonathan did calligraphy. So that's meant to be like a quill mm -hmm. pen Mm -hmm. underneath his name there yeah um so they're doing that and they're there holding it um and then what what people across the country would be creating these panels you know specific sizes mm -hmm. then they would mail them off to san francisco and then volunteers in san francisco would then uh sew the panels together into sections of the quilt and that's what you see on the right there is the section of the quilt that had jonathan's panel on it um, so at the 1987 March on Washington for Lesbian and Gay Rights, that was the first time that all of the sections that had been created as of that time were displaying the quilt panels um, for the, you know, thousands of folks who um, were victims of AIDS, victims of AIDS. So, yeah. Um, and then the collection later, we also have um, home movies and photos of um, they what would happen what happens with the quilt is sections of it would then be sort of lent out across the country so we had times when um, sections were coming to omaha and lincoln yeah um so dr meredith bacon that's another um, important collection for us another early collection for us um she's probably you know the if not one of if not the um, most important person um, to date in omaha or you know uno's lgbtq history um she sent her you know she's a political scientist spent her entire career here at uno um she was the first trans professor to serve as the president of a faculty senate um serve a term before she transitioned and after she transitioned so for this and other reasons when she transitioned in 2005 um you know her story was across the news both here you know hyper locally in the gateway which is our student newspaper but also Omaha newspapers and news outlets, uh, as well as nationally, like she and her mm -hmm. wife, Lynn Bacon, appeared in People magazine. <laughs> OK, um, they were on Good Morning America. <laughs> this was a this was a very big deal, the story of their transition mm -hmm. um, and their life together. So Dr. Bacon, um, uh, you know, retired, had retired in 2016, and she very generously donated to us photos, some of her research material, but also you can see one example there. Um, she had saved all of the emails, letters, and cards that she and her wife, Lynn, um, had received, and um, copies of some of the, you know, like, the emails and things, and letters they had sent out to people um, announcing this, so um, that's a, that's a very uh, important collection for us. Uh, advance. There we go. <laughs> okay. So um, just to mention then, so we have papers from those individual folks, um, couples and individuals, and we also have some organizational records that are here. So the Metropolitan Community Church of Omaha um, uh, donated their collection to us in um, 2017. Sorry, I had to think there for a second. Um, <laughs> Uh, so the MCC Church um, was founded in California in the 1960s, and then as it grew, they would establish churches across the country. So in the early 70s, they came to Omaha. They were established here in Omaha in 74. Um, so in the early church bulletins in the 70s and 80s basically functioned as you know, an LGBTQ plus community newsletter. It had events, but it also had columns and articles sharing news and personal experiences. Um, so we're very excited that they donated their, their material to us. It's very rich in photos, um, as well as some, some church documents. Um, you know, and the church grew, was growing here in Omaha, um, you know, in the 80s. At one point, there was a second um, MCC Church of Omaha, um, a little further out west. And for a while, there was also an MCC in Lincoln. It later contracted, so we're just back to the um, the the one MCC church here now. Um, so, um, and we're very fortunate right now um, that uh, we have a library science graduate student named Kaz who is doing an internship with us, and they very specifically wanted to work on um, QA collections. So they are actually processing these records for us, which is wonderful. 
so that means they'll be arranged and described and more easily used by researchers. Um, and then uh, the collection uh, you see here is uh, some things um, documenting Omaha's first lesbian alternative band, Lavender Couch. Um, this came to the archives in 2018, um, not directly from one of the band members, but sort of with a, a secondary courier, um, um, a local teacher who at the time worked for Omaha Public Schools named Emily Brush, who worked on a summer program there. Um, and um, she knew them and um, it, it's a very long story but it's a wonderful story uh, so it, but it's a great collection because it's got flyers lots of photos um, and then also a really cool thing it's got their their debut self-titled um, album which is a you know very lovely you know early 1990s cassette tape um, oh, they said they they published on cassette rather than um, going with um, a CD because CDs were like they were out at that point. They were still new. I mean, I didn't have a CD player yet, mm -hmm. um, but they were they were happening. Um, but they published on cassette tape because that was less expensive. So, um, and we're very fortunate. Uh, they the original four members um, sat down with us this past June during Pride Month, mm -hmm. and we did kind of uh, you know them sharing some of their memories of of the band and Omaha music and um, their own experiences, and uh, hopefully um, you know in 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 the next times when folks are comfortable getting together we can um do a reunion and we've we talked about maybe getting them back back together and doing a couple songs from their album I think that actually do a concert or something that would be awesome <laughs> I mean, we'll, call it, we'll do a show we'll do a show they no one said no um to it with the understanding that because the, the 30th anniversary of the album coming out is um is in like two years so they've got time to work up to it um, so uh, that, that's, that was a super fun event. And that was, you know, very conscious, something we'd been talking about doing for several months. Um, that was the, I was actually the only, um, that was the first and only um, virtual event the archives did during the pandemic, um, really until like <laughs> very recently. Um, so that's, it was, it was a lot of fun for us. Um, so I'm gonna talk about our um, oral history initiative, LGBT plus voices. So this was something again mentioned in like the very first organizing meetings um, mm. that folks the, the non-archivists were excited about you know doing something like an oral history project um I'll, I'll introduce the woman in the lower right corner there that's dr carolyn fiscus also known as big mama um she's a retired um uh, professor here from uno she um she's ho-chunk she was director of native american studies um here for many years and and then just taught for a long time after her uh, semi-retirement um so uh she was one of the first people interviewed for the project and the interviews actually started in fall of 2016 thanks to my wonderful colleague dr jay Irwin. um he's a sociologist here at uno um, and he was excited about the archives you know from from before day one um he was actually teaching the intro to lgbtq studies course um from the sociology department that fall and he was like hey i want to include the archives um i want you to come over and share some things and talk about what's in the archives but then also i'm he was willing he was you know i talked about yeah i've worked with classes at other institutions where students have gathered oral history interviews and they've gone to the archives so he was willing to give that a try and um all credit to jay he spent a lot of time that summer and early fall um developing a, a potential list of interviewees from the community um and, and then trying to track people down and get them to agree to be interviewed, which um, it's a lot of a lot of like work so to get these to get these um, projects off the ground. Um, so all all thanks to to Jay there on that. Um, the project, um, you know, mixed results that first semester. Um, I think. Uh, but there were 15 or 16 interviews that were done by students in pairs. Um, eventually, 12 of the people who were interviewed agreed that their interviews could come to the archives and be shared with people. Um, you can ask me what happened to those other three or four people later if you want to know more. Um, but it was it was a good project. Jay and I felt good about it, but it was also like, this is not sustainable to, to do this because it was a lot of work for him and it was you know a fair bit of work for me as well. Um, so what we had talked about doing, what we'd wanted to do was do some private fundraising. Um, you know, and that was something we talked about from that first reception we had, you know, while telling the community about the archives in, in 2016 was, hey, we've also established a fund at the University of Nebraska Foundation to support the QOA. Um, here's how you can give to it. So we've done a, a small amount of fundraising that way. And then we applied to our Humanities Nebraska, um, which uh, 
gave us a, a mini grant, um, which we then matched with some private money um, that we'd received. And then the UNO Libraries um, was fortunate to have um, a small fund. It's the Eugene, Eugene S. and Sunny M. Thomas Fund for Innovation. So if I get a grant, I can apply for like matching, fu matching funds from that. Um, so that helped us to sort of double some of that money we, were, we got from um, Humanities Nebraska and the Nebraska Cultural Endowment. Um, and we applied for a grant from that organization in um, 2017. Uh, we're able to hire Luke Wegner. Um, and he's been wonderful, um, got him trained, and he started interviewing folks in 2017. Um, and then in 2018, we applied for a, a second grant from Unis Nebraska and got that. And, um, you know, again, a little bit of private money and sort of kept cobbling together money to keep Luke on staff very part time, <laughs> you know, kind of um, very, very part time working for us. But um, it, I, I, don't, I don't know that it worked, but it, um, I would say mixed results. Um, the good news is we've, you know, 50 interviews have been collected, um, you know, over the last four or five years, well, five years, I guess. Um, and most of them are available to folks on our website. But, um, you know, this is one of my big fundraising goals is to be able to hire someone full time, um, either an archivist or a staff member. Um, you know, if it's if it's only project money for a couple of years, that's OK. But to have someone full time to be able to collect even more interviews. Um, um, so that's that's sort of my uh, a bigger a bigger fundraising goal I have for for that. So yeah, um, we also did um, some um, uh, online giving campaigns like those 24-hour giving campaigns. Um, we weren't allowed to do like the local community one, but there was one called Give Out Day, which is for LGBTQ plus organizations around the country. So we did that um, for two years in 2018 and 2019. Uh, very pleasantly surprised the first year raised over $1,000 and had lots of donors, which um, exceeded my expectations. Um, the second year only raised um, a few hundred dollars, didn't have as many donors, um, so decided to not continue that. <laughs> um, and, and that was for a bunch of reasons as well. Um, and I was like, I, you know, did that, all right. Um, but then in 2020, um, the University of Nebraska at Omaha launched its first 24-hour um, day of giving called um, Wear Black, Give Back. And so we did that last year for the QOA in 2020, in um, October 2020, and um, uh, the library was, um, I should say the QOA was the, raised the most money of the different initiatives from the library. So um, not a huge amount of money, but um, we did, we did had respectable, respectable numbers for the first year. And we will be participating in that again. So if you'd like to support the QOA, um, Google Wear Black Give Back um, Queer Omaha Archives, and you can give uh, to us that, uh, that was actually the live part of it is next week on the 13th and 14th, but you can give any time. Or you can go to our University of Nebraska page and give any time. Um, sorry, got to plug that. Yeah. So um, let me talk a little bit about outreach. Um, uh, keep an eye on time, Krista. Uh, so we've done a variety also, of. I mentioned since you're talking about searching for that, that um, in case anyone's wondering, um, we will have um, Amy's slides available afterwards with all this information on it and links to a lot of the things she's been talking about too. I got your email with the links to the archive page and the. Um, wear black, give back page, and everything else. So um, you'll have access to all this later. Great. Um, if anybody does have any questions, go ahead and get typed into your questions section so we can get them asked before we do wrap up today. So type in there any questions, comments, or anything you want to say. Yeah, so let me talk about outreach. Um, we've done some typical um, things, like typical for us here in Archives and Special Collections, typical for an academic library, and then we've certainly done some things that were new to um to us at academic library it may not all be new to you but we're very new to us so one thing that was new to me was collaborating with um an art center so the bemis center for contemporary art is located here in omaha um they brought in um a, a canadian american trans artist named castles um who did some, was doing some installation pieces and then was doing a um um a second um installation slash happening <laughs> um, uh, in, the, in the late spring of their, their kind of four month um, time their exhibit was up. But they invited the QOA to um, 
help um, do some kind of local history research. So was doing that. And then they also said, hey, you've got some really neat stuff. Can we borrow some things? So I lent them some posters and some visual items they could put up in a gallery um, adjacent to Castle's work. And then what's in the photo here is one thing that the curator was really keen on, and I grew keen, keen to it as well, was, um, hey, can we have some archival boxes on display? <laughs> So we put out these gray boxes. Um, most of them are empty, but they we put a sticker on them um, on the outside. And then we put photocopies in one box that was open and labeled the folders as you would if it were, you know, real documents. But um, this is meant to represent the papers of Dr. Meredith Bacon. So that was the actual size of her collection at that time um, and, and sort of what it looked like. And so that's what the labels on the outside are. Um, you know, and this was a lesson learned, you know, um, I, I said yes to, you know, loaning these items. Um, and then they said, hey, can you do a gallery talk? And I was like, what does that mean? Um, so I'd never done that kind of formal gallery talk before. So that was a great, great experience. Um, and then they asked me to participate in this other installation piece. And I, I was sort of skeptical and was, I will, I will say I was uncertain. I was uncertain about what that would be like. Um, and, um, but I said, yes. And it was a mostly a positive experience. Um, one part I wish I had said no to was on the day of the event, when I got there, they were like, okay, Amy, time for you to come back and be filmed. And I'm like, be filmed for what? <laughs> Um, so they, there was a, a film that went along with its installation, um, mm -hmm. and so I appear in that film, and I was um, not prepared for that. Shall you we say? You mentioned that before. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I was like, ah, if that was ever mentioned, I missed that, and mm -hmm. um, did not find that in the earlier emails. I'll just say that. Mm -hmm. But um, so you know, I, I, if I'd been maybe more confident, I maybe would have said no to that in the moment, but uh, did not feel confident. So. People, it's okay to say no. Let's just remind <laughs> ourselves. Um, so we've done some more traditional things. So this is um, one of the gallery here um, in UNO Libraries, Chris Library. Um, and this is Terry Sweeney, the donor I talked about before, our first non-university donor. And here he is being interviewed by a student for the UNO TV show, who then also wrote like an article about him for the student newspaper and about this show. Um, so Terry is a great friend of the archives, you know, as well as a donor. And then of course we also do other displays in the library in like flat display cases we have throughout the building. Those tend to be, you know, they might be book displays, um, but also like just smaller displays. Like right now during LGBTQ History Month, um, our intern Kaz, my, Claire, Claire, my colleague Claire Delaney, did two um, flat cases right outside the archives here um, on the first floor. And one is about um, actually things from Terry's paper, Terry and Pat's papers about the Omaha leather community. And a second one about um, the UNO, the current UNO student, um, LGBTQ plus student organization, queer and trans services. So um, those are always happening. I about that um, either on Twitter or Facebook. I saw some um, someone share about that. Was that you or somebody else that shared? So excited about, so excited about the displays here. <laughs> It, it might have been our intern. Yeah, our, our intern was involved with that. I'm not sure. Might, might, have, might have been me as well. Um, but we, you know, we have our current intern, but we've also had past interns. And so we always, you know, talk with them about what kind of projects do you want to do? So we had one past intern who was like very excited about creating some zines for us. So here they are at work um, creating our QOA zine. And what they did was they listened to lots of the interviews that we had at that time and they picked out quotes. And these interviews were not transcribed. So they had to listen and pick out quotes. It was great. Um, and they would put a quote on a page and then include like a photo or a flyer or a poster or something from the collection um, on the page of that zine as well. So you kind of you see the back, I have the, the end of the, the backside there because it has their credit line on it. Um, you know, we've also done things like our library has a button maker. So um, yeah, sometimes we make it. buttons <laughs> um, and hand those out. Um, you know, it's it, it works okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, we, we are a library, you know, in, in an academic setting. So, of course, we also do instruction sessions. Um, and those include both UNO students, classes from a range of disciplines. Sometimes they're, they're coming in specifically just to see the QOA material. Um, and sometimes, you know, they're coming in you know, to see a range of material, and we are very conscious of, you know, presenting QA material alongside other topical things. You know, when we had the Western history class come in, yeah, 
here's here's things from QOA that are in that collection. Um, so that's been great for our university students, but also when we've had middle and high school students coming in for either, you know, maybe a quick, they might come in for a quick like 20 minute tour, or sometimes they'll come in for like a like an hour or two hour session in the archives. We also very consciously include um, material from QOA in those visits. And, you know, it's great seeing our UNO students get excited about it, but when you see like a younger, younger student, you know, who, you know, they're seeing that representation, they're like seeing a bit of history and like, you know, that, that LGBTQ plus identities they may have are represented there. That is a beautiful moment to see. Um, and it's a wonderful experience every time. So. Um, these photos here are from some past receptions we've hosted both for internal, um, you know, UNO events or for um, external events like conferences or meetings that were happening on campus. And then, of course, we table at various community events. Um, you know, we're at Heartland Pride Festival every year. Um, we don't say we do that every year. Um, we've gone to like the River City Mix Chorus had a big anniversary conference or concert. We, um, you know, took a multiple tables of, of things from their history out to that. Um, but, you know, I've one another lesson learned is it's okay to say no. Um, you know, we, we can't go to every thing, you know, mm -hmm. that is, you know, that we either get invited to and or hear about. So mm -hmm. we, we try to go to various things, but, um, you know, even if, um, you know, we had a an archivist who is dedicated to the QOA full time, which we do not. Um, you know, I don't know they would have time to go to every tabling event mm -hmm. out there. Um, so, you know, that's that was one thing definitely um, after the early days. You know, early days felt like it couldn't say no, needed to go. Uh, but then after a couple of years, you know, when someone sort of last minute would say, hey, we're doing this thing, like literally, um, we're doing a thing like next Sunday, a week away, and uh, it's it's before our like fun run, uh, we'd love you to come out and table at like 9 a.m. on Sunday, and I'm like, yeah, no, we can't make it. <laughs> oh, can't make it for a whole host of reasons, there, but thank you for the invitation. Okay. If you'd ever like to come come visit the archives, please do. So, you know, can you're, you're worried when you're first starting something like I don't want to offend anyone. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, like that organization out when it was new. Yeah, when it was new, of course. Yeah. Yeah. And there's there's still plenty of people and organizations who don't know, unfortunately, don't know who we are, what we're doing yet. Um, but most people, you know, they don't take offense when you're just like, mm, thank you, but I can't, we can't make it, we can't do that event, but could we do something else? And mm -hmm. so, you know, I'm regularly saying like, hey, yeah, sorry, we can't table at your event in the park. That really doesn't work out for us schedule wise or the archival material or whatever the reasons might be. But would you ever like to, um, hey, you have a monthly board meeting. Would you like to come meet here in our library? Um, mm -hmm. We can do like a pop-up display and give you a, give me 10 minutes, give me a half hour, however much time you want to give me to talk about it. Because um, what I'm, I want them to know we have it. And then I'm also, of course, prospecting for future donations of material and money too, but donations, you know, usually first in this case. Um, so I've extended lots of offers like that. Um, you know, not everybody takes you up on that offer right away, but you keep making the offer. Um, mm -hmm. Low pressure sales tactics. It's very low pressure. <laughs> Usually low pressure, yeah. There's there's one gentleman who um, I've seen him at. Um, we've been at Pride, you know, for five years. We didn't. There was no Pride here in Omaha last year, of course. Um, but like every year at Pride, I think he's introduced himself to me and told me what organization he, you know, volunteers with. And I'm like, oh, that's great. We'd love to have those records. And he's talked. He's told me about the records a little bit <laughs> and where they're stored, and so I know about them now. Every year he does this, uh, but he won't give me his like he he wouldn't give me his email or phone number. And every year I give him our brochure, I give him my business card. I said we'd love to give you a tour, um, and he always said no. And like this year when I saw him at Pride again, like you know within like a couple seconds I was like it's you, it's you <laughs> sir. And I, I, I called, he was with a friend who hadn't met me before and I, I was joking about it. And I was like, oh yeah, we're old friends, but he just won't, he won't tell me, you know, how to get in touch with them. And I was, you know, joking, joking a little, maybe a little, a little hard, intense. Um, but he, he, I want to say he caved, but <laughs> I went to his house, Krista. He, um, he, this year he donated um, some of his, his books, some of his book collection to us. So I still don't have his art, the archival records he has access to, but we got the book. So that's exciting. <laughs> finally, finally it, it takes, yeah, you just gotta keep, yeah. Yeah. 
Um, so, oh, so I should say something about social media too. I, I look at so our social media that way too. We very intentionally do not have um, separate social media accounts for the QOA or for our archives and special collections in general. I've had to run those before and I was like, let's just stick with the libraries. And so we make use of those accounts. Um, but we also very consciously like, yes, we post a lot of QOA content in October and June, but you know what? Um, I celebrate, you know, American Archives Month throughout the year. I also celebrate LGBTQ History Month, <laughs> LGBTQ History like every day. So, um, you know, hey, when we can cross post, you know, it, hey, February's Black History Month, let's put some QOA content out there. Um, March is Women's History Month, let's put some QOA content out there. You know, and very consciously like this is women's history, but this is also LGBTQ history. Um, so we're we're doing that kind of thing on social media, um, but not like intensely, intensely. Um, so I'll just, this slide here is a slide I've started using when I'm going out and giving a talk to like a corporation's employee resource group or a community organization. It's kind of it's like the call to action, right? At the end of the talks, people are like, this is great. What do I do? Um, so this is what, uh, you know, that I talk with folks about, you know, the donation process, what kind of things we're looking for um, as far as material for the archives. And then I just say like, hey, if you can, if you want to visit, come in for a tour, we'll do a pop-up display, do some research of your own, wonderful, online or in person, you know, share, you know, send a link to somebody, post a link on social media. Um, if I'm giving you that brochure, feel free to pass it on to somebody else later, give them my contact information, whatever it might be. Um, because, you know, I, I'm under no illusions. Not everyone in the community knows about the archives, right? Um, and, and that's both our UNO communities and our, our greater Omaha, let alone Nebraska and Western Iowa. So I mm -hmm. appreciate all the support we can get from people. Um, you know, and then financial contributions, I've sort of talked about that throughout. Um, you know, big dream there would be to basically endow the entire collection and um, name it, have it named for someone. So it could be the Krista Burns LGBTQ <laughs> collection. Just laying the groundwork here, Krista, for you and your family. Um, or the Amy Schindler, whatever they want to do, you know, you can name it honor someone too. Um, and then, um, you know, asking folks if they want to volunteer to be interviewed for oral history, that's great. Um, you know, we are going to be, um, we have Luke back on the um, QA oral histories right now for just a few weeks to kind of tie up some loose ends. Um, uh, and then that'll, that will be, um, unless we raise a whole bunch of money, <laughs> um, that'll be, we'll be pausing that for a while. We'll be kind of think about, you know, um, what's, what's next for that part of the archives. The archives is going to continue, but the oral history portion is what we're sort of pausing a bit. So um, yeah, um, our website, you know, we originally started on Omeka.net website because we could have digital collections and static pages together. This year we have migrated to Island Dora for our digital collections and we've moved the QOA web pages back to, or to, they were never on, the main library site in the university's content management system. So that's that's been good. Um, uh, you know, it was time for that, right? Maybe a little pastime. <laughs> um, and I just want to end on a note of gratitude here, if I could, and appreciation to both the donors, um, users, or researchers, folks interested in the collect, um, people just like passing by um, who've shown an interest. And then, you know, my colleagues here in our archives and our, our university libraries, but also across the state of Nebraska. Um, and those are GLAM institutions across the state um, who've shown, again, an interest or support um, in a variety of ways. Um, the archives is, I think it's truly a place filled with individual and community stories and voices. Um, certainly much more than I can do justice today, but um, thank you for this time. And um, I invite folks on behalf of the UNO Libraries Archives and Special, Special Collections to visit us online, come to the library. We are back open to the public again without appointments, um, you know, or contact me and I'd be happy to come out and we could do a pop-up display at a location or um, do a talk on a specific topic, um, you know, so reach out, um, you know, funding and traveling exhibit, that might be something, that's that's an idea for our future. Um, our first grant proposal on that was unsuccessful a few years ago, but maybe it's time to try again. So, yeah, um, yeah. So thank Great you. Work, definitely. <laughs> yeah. All right, is that your last slide then? That was, yeah. yeah. Okay. Did you know if they Polish me too quickly. All right. Thank you so much, Amy. Um, anybody have any questions for Amy um, as we're wrapping up here? Get typed in the question section. Nobody had any questions during, but that's fine. Um, during their exploring your site and looking at everything. Um, this is great. I was so, so, like I said, so glad to have you guys back, you back um, 
uh, you know, five years later to talk about how things are going. And I'm very happy that it's just so impressive, so many things that you've got to now and how much um, it's expanded. Um, are you any at all concerned about space? <laughs> limitations. I mean, you talk. You talk about a lot of donations and everything. Um, do you have um, room for expansion, or how's that going? <laughs> Yeah, I think I think space is an issue for um, lots of cultural heritage organizations when we're talking about archival material. Certainly here in Omaha, um, lots of us will talk about our needs, um, both archives and museums for storage. Um, we are okay here at UNO Libraries. Um, a ye, well, I would say maybe two years ago, I would have said, no, no, we we're, we're we need to get more space. So we are actually repurposing um, some uh, compact shelving. Um, that um, in another part of the library, and we're getting a lot. It's getting locked down, so we can move um, out to that. So it'll be in the general library area, but locked down. Mm -hmm. So we're going to move like the the not some not rare things out there. Sure. So that will free up some storage space in our climate, you know, controlled and monitored and, and secure um, collection storage space here in in the archives and special collections for archival materials and um, you know most of the book collection and things like that. So right. we're doing okay. That's only a midterm solution. So you know, if you ask that question again in like six years, it might be a different. Yeah. I'll be like, we're looking for space unless some some big thing happens. Again, if there's a donor out there who would like to sponsor um, some offsite storage for Omaha's local mm -hmm. cultural heritage organizations, um, uh, there's a whole bunch of us who who would appreciate that. Yeah. Um, Not book question. storage, collection yeah, storage. Here. Um, uh, Anika up in Norfolk. Norfolk, Nebraska just had its first ever Pride event in September. Awesome. Um, I think the, I know the answer to this question. Would the archive be interested in material from that event? Absolutely, Anika. Thank you for, for reaching out about that. Yeah, um, we'd, we'd love to have, you know, if you want to send me links to social media postings or if you have flyers, other things, photos, um, or know who does, um, who does have some of content, um, please. I, yeah, let's talk about that. That'd be great. Yeah, um, exactly. yeah. yeah we've um, we've had conversations with different cultural heritage institutions across the state um, about local content. You know, in some cases, um, there was um, a donor in Wayne who um, did an oral yeah. history interview with us and um, had some material and um, said, you know, they, they offered it to us. And I said, we'd love to have it, but let me just double check that there is a, an, an institution in Wayne that this should go to kind of thing. Right. Yeah. So that's a very common thing for us, a conversation for us to have, right? So um, if a donor comes to us and they're like a UNO student or a UNO, or I'm sorry, UNL, University of Nebraska Lincoln student or employee, um, I'll say, this is wonderful. It definitely needs to be preserved. Um, let's talk with, our colleagues down at the University of Nebraska Lincoln, because that that they may want it, you know, if the donor is yeah, open to that. Yeah, yeah. If the if the if the donor is open to that, of course, some donors, you know, mm -hmm. they've got a they've got a beef or they, they, for whatever reason they may have. Yeah, they want it where they want it. Sometimes, yeah. sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you can say, yeah, thanks. Um, another question, and I think you might have mentioned this earlier, um, but we'll explain again. I guess, do you accept? So, do you accept material from outside Nebraska? Um, yes and no. So, um, books, yes. Um, periodicals, no, unless it's Western Iowa. Okay. Um, if it is some, if we're talking about someone's personal papers or organizational records, um, I'd want to know more about that person or that mm -hmm. organization. Um, so again, it might be that conversation of. Um, you know, it's great that you want to donate this to us, but if they're in, um, you know, Minneapolis, Chicago, Kansas City, which for those of you not in the Midwest are, you know, cities kind of nearish <laughs> by to different, uh, different extents, um, mm -hmm. you know, have you talked to a repository in your, your home city or where you are now, or what is their reason for contacting us and figuring out what that may be? And there's some sort of connection to UNO maybe from this person or from this, from these documents for some reason. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, you're, you do have things from outside of the we Omaha do. area, yeah. but, you know, you, you are called the Queer Omaha Archive. Yep. It is supposed to be, you know, here's something for the Midwest, that particular area, yep. 
and there may be something similar somewhere else. So yeah, yeah. see if that's Wait. where it might be better to reside. And let me just clear, we are the Queer Omaha Archives, but we do collect Omaha, Western Nebraska, but also the entire state of Nebraska. Right. Um, so, Omaha. you know, we have, um, we have a donor who, you know, went to Wayne State and they're, they're from that part of the state, which is, you know, what, an hour or two from Omaha. Um, they don't have a connection to Omaha or UNO, but they've donated content to mm -hmm. us. Um, and they no longer, you know, they live on the West Coast now. So um, we appreciate that support. Yeah, mm -hmm. but it doesn't have to be that straight up Omaha connection. So yeah. we're willing to consider it, but so, um, I have no I, problem directing people to other institutions. Yes. So the, the answer would be reach out and ask. ask yeah. Contact Amy yeah. and say, so this is who I am. This is what I've got. But help me figure out where it should be. <laughs> mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. I don't see any other okay. questions here. Um, anybody have any desperate last minute questions you want to ask of Amy, go ahead and get it typed in. Um, but I'll work on here now. I'm going to um, pull presenter control back to my screen to work on wrapping things up for this morning. Uh, thank you, Amy. Let's see. My new screen. There we go. Um, so this is the page for the show. And I did, um, we do have a link here all right in the show description that goes to the archive page there and um and there's other links that amy has sent me that i think i'll add to when i when i put up the uh, recording the oral history page um you know and here's the information about the uh of the lg btq voices project um, link to the digital collections <gasps> where black give back <laughs> Um, oh, here's a question that I don't, may or may not have the answer to, Amy. Uh, how many queer libraries are there in the U.S. or collections like this? Do you know? Oh, um, hundreds, you know, because there, there are certainly some institutions where, um, or repositories rather, where it is solely dedicated to, you know, LGBTQ history in general or some specific facet of the community. So like in Nebraska, or I'm sorry, in Chicago, there's a leather um, archive and museum, right? But then there's, you know, many, many more, hundreds, if not, well, probably thousands of repositories like UNO Libraries, Archives and Special Collections, where, you know, we collect mm -hmm. a variety of, of in a variety of different areas. And um, the QOA here is a very important one, but it's, it's just part of the multifaceted collecting that we do so mm -hmm. there yeah. there is a directory or there was i haven't i didn't check today to make sure it's still out there that was started by the society of american archivists um lgbtq plus section called lavender legacies at least that's what it used to be called um i volunteered for it a lifetime ago um they and they had a directory of repositories um mostly us but some canadian as well so mm -hmm. um that might be a place if you if you're wondering if there's one near mm -hmm. you that might be a place to check. Or I would just encourage you, you know, hey, reach out to your local university or larger mm -hmm. public library and ask them if they know, and they may be able to tell you pretty quickly. Or you can email me and I'll, I can check and do it too. Ah, Anika just shared something. Let's see if I can get this to go up here. Um, and so, and so, so, so yours, the career, you are the only one that you know that's specific to this in Nebraska? Yes, I've I've heard from I will say full disclosure I've heard from other glam organizations they're interested in doing a similar sort of collecting initiative, um, but um, not off the ground as far as I'm aware. But you know if you're if you're in Lincoln, go talk to the folks at uh, UNL um, Archives mm -hmm. and Special Collections. They have lots of LGBTQ collections, um, or the Public Library in Lincoln may have some as well. Um, mm -hmm. My colleague at UNK has has some material. So it's, mm -hmm. it is out there. It just may not be like they've named it a thing like we have. Right, that's what I say. Many places may have these types of materials, but they don't have it as a whole, yeah, here's the thing. Yeah. yeah that's what we've named it and we've announced it and made it its own separate, yeah. yeah. Just um, like, so you know, we, yeah, we had LGBTQ it. collections before 2016. It just, they weren't, they weren't named. I, I'll just say it that way. An entity or their own special collection. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So here's the thing that Anika did send, um, Lavender Legacies, Lesbian and Gay Archives Roundtable. 
he's from the Society of American Archivists, yeah. Mm -hmm. Guide to Sources in North America. So this is what you were talking about then? Yep. 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 And you can see here's all the different states that have something. Mm -hmm. And, and now I'm wondering if I've updated ours. Oh, uh, this could be embarrassing. Oh, good, we're there. Okay. <laughs> oh, there you are. Omaha, current holdings, access and uses. A lot of, oh, they've got a lot of re re references, a lot of information right here oh. on their site about it, too. That's nice. That's out of date, though. So don't, you know, go to our website. Don't, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. To be updated. <laughs> All right, that's it. Yes, over here. So, and I did look, I found um, this is the post that I was talking about. Uh, is this is your intern, correct? It is. That's Kaz. Yeah. Hey, Kaz, you're on TV. Hope it's okay. <laughs> hey, they posted about it. My displays are up. <laughs> We're proud of their work. Yep. Yeah. So, that was very cool. I saw that. All right, so I think we will wrap it up for today. Thank you everyone for being here. Thank you so much, Amy, this is great. Um, glad to have this information out there. Uh, I will be, we will be posting the recording at our website and here is our main Encompass Live page. And you see right underneath here are our upcoming shows and right underneath here is linked to our archives. It'll be at the top of the list. The most recent ones are always at the top here. Um, by the end of the day tomorrow, as long as GoToWebinar and YouTube cooperate with me, I should have it up here. Uh, everyone who um, registered for today's show and signed up will get an email directly um, from me, letting you know what's ready. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, we also push it out onto our various social media. Um, we'll have a link to recording, a link to the slides, and any other links here that I've got saved and opened up as well. Um, also let you know there is a search feature here if you do want to search our show archives. Uh, you can search the entire archives or just the most recent 12 months if you want something just recent, just current. Um, that is because this is the full show archive. I'm not going to go all the way to the bottom, but um, going back to the very beginning of Encompass Live, we premiered in January 2009 and we do have all of our shows here on this long, long page. Um, so just do pay attention when you are watching any of our recording show, recorded shows. Um, they all have an original broadcast date, so do pay attention to that. Uh, some of the information we post uh, maybe um, will stand the test of time, will still be accurate, correct information, but some things will get old. Um, links may be broken, resources may no longer exist or has changed drastically. Um, so just pay attention when you are watching something. Uh, for example, if I, since we talked about this, here is the original show from the Queer Eye Night back in 2016. So um, you could watch that recording if you want to, but you can see where, where Amy started. <laughs> um, but definitely watch today's show for the full link and today's information about it. <laughs> um, we do have a Facebook page, which I have over here. There we go. Um, if you do like to use Facebook, give us a like when Facebook is working. <laughs> um, here's your reminder about logging into today's show. We do some information about meet our presenter, um, but we always use um, the hashtag and live on other social media. We do Twitter and, and Instagram as well through the library commission. So you can keep an eye on what we're doing over there as well. And it's back to my main page here. Uh, so that will wrap it up for today's show. Thank you everybody for being here. Thank you, Amy. It's so good to see you again. Um, we will, as you can see here, we will not be having a show next week. It's my one week off throughout the year, <laughs> during the year of Encompass Live. Um, whenever it is our State Library Association annual conference, uh, we take that week off. Everybody's in, involved the conference that week, so we get a week off from the show. So uh, next week is our Nebraska Library Association conference. Um, and one um, is doing a combination virtual day on Wednesday and in person on Thursday. So if you are a Nebraska librarian, um, working in the Nebraska library, hope you may be attending that. Um, but we'll be back the week after that, um, talking with the uh, Nebraska Department of Labor, Division of Reemployment Services about helping um, people who are looking for um, reemployment. Um, the Department of Labor wants to work with our libraries in the state, so definitely sign up for that and hear more about that and any of our other upcoming shows. I'll be filling in more of the November dates here. Don't you worry, I've got, I've got things on the schedule and I'm just working on finalizing things. So keep your eye on our website. 
So um, hopefully, uh, thank you, everybody. We'll see you on a future episode of Encompass Live. We'll see you in two weeks. Bye-bye. And our recording has stopped. Cool.